Part 10, Faith in the Infinite, Faith in the Successful Outcome of Your Efforts, Your Undertakings, Your Expression of Your Innate Powers, Leads Inevitably to Your Faith in Yourself Your Faith in Your Real Self and in Its Powers and Capacities for the Efficient Performance of the Work which Constitutes Your Field of Outward Expression. In Truth, Faith in your real self in your I A M I inevitably leads you to that highest and most magnificent manifestation of faith and confident expectation namely, faith in and the confident expectation of the manifestation of the beneficence and kindly power of that infinite presencia power from which all things proceed, and in which all things live and move and have their being, that there exists an infinite and eternal presencia power an infinite and absolute principle of life, mind, will which is the source, Fount and origin of all manifested living existence, which is the creative agency by means of which all creation exists and is performed, which is the combining, correlating, and coordinating power evident in all the processes of the cosmos, such as the inevitable, invariable, and infallible report of human reason exercised to the full limits of its powers along the lines of philosophical thought, and such is also the report of human faith extended to its full capacity. Reason finds this report inevitably present as the base and ground of its most profound thought. Intuition corroborates and verifies such conclusion. The opposite of this ultimate report of combined reason and intuition is unthinkable to deny it is equivalent to the denial of the very base and ground of rational thought itself. In that volume of the present series entitled Spiritual Power, we have considered this subject in detail and at length, and have shown not only that reason is compelled by its fundamental laws to make a final report of this kind, but also just why it is compelled to do so. In addition, we have shown that intuition agrees in this final report of truth, and just why this is inevitable. The consideration of the facts so presented brings the conviction that this fundamental intuition of truth is as firmly established and as little open to successful denial and refutation, as is the fact of the fundamental intuitive assurance of the reality of your actual existence as a living entity. Here, faith becomes an actual knowing it rises to the position of a faith that knows, not merely believes. Reason and intuition, employed to their full limits of power and capacity for the discovery and announcing of truth, establish the following basic and fundamental facts of existence, viz. 1. That there is present in being and power an infinite and eternal creative power which is the causeless cause of the cosmic manifestation, in whole and in its parts of the world and its manifold activities which are experienced by us through our consciousness. 2. That there is present and in being an infinite and eternal coordinative power which combines, correlates and coordinates the activities of the multiplicity of apparently separate objects and activities of the cosmos into one harmonious whole operating under universal law in order in which there is no room or place for blind chance or accident. 3. That there is present in being and power an infinite and eternal life principle, which is the constant, permanent, unchangeable, invariable identical essential essence of livingness which animates and inspires the countless manifestations of life and livingness perceived to exist in the cosmos and which is the essential base and ground for the multiplicity of changing, temporal, impermanent living forms and their activities which arise, abide for a time, and then pass away in the cosmic process. 4. That the infinite and eternal creative power the infinite and eternal coordinative power the infinite and eternal life principle are, at the last, but one one in essence, substance and reality, they are but aspects under which we become aware of the absolute presencia power which is the source and origin the base and ground the creator and the author the supporter and the sustainer, the combiner, creator and coordinator the essence and substance of the entire cosmic manifestation consisting of an infinity of universes with all contained therein. This one absolute presencia power is absolute unity absolute presence, absolute power. It is the ultimate reality, the final and basic fact, the absolute truth of existence. There is and can be nothing known to us except this ultimate reality and its cosmic manifestations. 5. This ultimate reality this infinite and eternal presencia power is discovered to be immaterial and not material, it is perceived to be pure spirit in its ultimate essence, in its real nature character and being. Its fundamental laws are spiritual laws, this being true even of the physical laws and principles operative in the world of materiality which is its cosmic manifestation. The world of manifestation, in its essence, 
is contained in the being of this infinite and eternal presencia power and this infinite and eternal presencia power is eminent and present in each and every part and portion, object or activity, of that world of manifestation. There is nowhere outside of the infinite presencia power, for in its presence and in its power this ultimate reality abides in everything, everywhere, and in all time. All is in the all and the all is in all things. 7. You your real self. Your I am I are center of power, a focal point of expression and manifestation, in and of that infinite and eternal spiritual power. In the degree that you realize this, so will be the degree of your possible manifestation of personal power. In the degree that you realize this, so will be the degree of your possible individual contact with the infinite presence of power, and of the opening and freeing of your spiritual channels of communication within from it. You may become in tune with the infinite in unison with infinity in this way. In this way, you may contact the infinite in consciousness. In the degree that you recognize and realize your actual essential identity with the infinite and eternal presence of power, so will be the degree of your possible manifestation, expression and actualization of that ultimate reality which is the source origin and found of infinite power and which is the infinite self of which your I am I is the focal point or center of expression and manifestation. In the volume of this series entitled Spiritual Power, to which we have referred, we have transmitted to you the following message of truth as announced in principle by the great illumined spiritual teachers of the race, of all ages, all peoples, all lands, all creeds which our students are requested to commit to memory and to make the essential and basic fact of their mental and spiritual lives. Hearken to this message of truth as announced by such high authorities, the message of truth. You, yourself, in your essential and real being, nature, and entity, are spirit, and not but spirit and end of spirit spiritual and not material. Materiality is your instrument of expression, the stuff created for your use and service in your expression of life consciousness and will, it is your servant, not your master you condition, limit and form it, not at you, when you recognize and realize your real nature, and awaken to a perception of its real relation to you and you to it. The report of spirit, received by its accredited individual centers of expression, and by them transmitted to you is this, a in the degree that you perceive, recognize, and realize your essential identity with me, the supreme presence of power, the ultimate reality, in that degree will you be able to manifest my spiritual power. I am over and above you, under and beneath you, I surround you on all sides. I am also within you, and you are in me from me you proceed, and in me you live and move and have your being. Seek me by looking within your own being, and likewise by looking for me in infinity, for I abide both within and without your being. If, and when, you will adopt and live according to this truth, then will you be able to manifest that truth in and by it alone are freedom and invincibility, and true and real presence and power, to be found, perceived, realized and manifested. In the above he has stated message of truth will be found the essence of the esoteric teaching and inner doctrine of all of the world's great religions and most profound philosophies. In all religions there exist, 1. The exoteric or outer teaching and doctrine intended for the great masses of persons who are unable to understand or to grasp the deep truths and doctrines those who are not as yet ready for the full truth, and who are not as yet able to bear the truth and, 2. The esoteric or inner teaching and doctrine intended for those who have developed spiritual perception to an extent enabling them to grasp, understand and assimilate the full spirit of the truth. In the sacred writings of all of these great religions will be found constant though carefully guarded references to the existence of this dual aspect of teaching and doctrine. The essence and substance of this inner doctrine, or esoteric teaching, is found to be practically and essentially the same in all of the great world religions and philosophies, notwithstanding the wide difference in the exoteric teaching and doctrines and in the names and forms employed therein. This essence and substance is found to be capable of expression in three brief general axioms, as follows, I. Ultimate reality, truth, being and principle is one and one only in its essential and fundamental nature it is spiritual and not material, the one ultimate principle of being is spirit. 2. The soul or spirit of man is identical in nature and essence with the infinite spiritual principle or being, it is a spark from the divine flame, a ray from the divine sun, 
or a reflection of the Divine Presence. This undetached fragment from the Divine Life is imminent within the being of every human individual, though usually undetected by reason of being hidden and covered with the massive finite, personal characteristics but no matter how much hidden or covered over, it is always there, its light burning brightly though obscured from ordinary perception. 3. By faith in the infinite presencia power, which abides within and without the individual soul, and by the confident expectation of its manifestation through the channels of individuality, the individual soul proceeds to clear away the obstructing debris of finite personality, with its mass of doubt, distrust, disbelief and unfaith, and to afford a clear passage of the spiritual light and power of the indwelling presencia power by so doing it also opens the channels of contact with and inspiration from the superimposing presencia power of infinity. Pause a moment at this point and consider carefully the above three axiomatic statements of the esoteric teaching and doctrine of all the great religions and philosophies. You will find that you have always known of these, though you have never clearly recognized them. If you have studied the great religions other than your own, you will now see that this teaching and doctrine is implicit in each and all of them. Piercing the surface of the exoteric teachings and doctrines of your own religion you will find this teaching and doctrine expressed in them in veiled and guarded terms. Now that your eyes have been opened to the truth, you will find corroboration of these teachings in many hitherto perplexing and mystifying passages in your own scriptures. If, as is probable, you have been reared in some branch of the Christian church, you will find in the words of the Master, and of that great teacher, St. Paul, numerous corroborations of this truth. If, instead, you are a Jew, you will find in the Hebrew Scriptures abundant testimony along the same lines the ancient prophets of Israel knew and taught this truth, as references to their writings willfully establish. Likewise, if you are a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Mohammedan, you will find in your sacred books a full corroboration of the above statement. As the ancient Oriental sages were wont to say, the truth is one, though men call it by many names, and express it by many different terms. Moreover, in all of the esoteric teaching and doctrine, so announced by the founders of the great religions and their successors, you will find that the road to the recognition, realization and manifestation of the truth is always that of the path of faith. Even before works, there is placed faith. Before the manifestation, there must come the full realization and before the full realization must come the full recognition and the perception, accompanied by the deep feeling of faith. Before the believer may justly expect to reap he must sow the seeds of confident expectation. Everywhere we find the repeated and constantly reiterated note of faith, faith, faith. We are constantly admonished to have faith, coupled with the promise that if faith be had and maintained all the rest shall be added unto you. In Jewish and Christian theology, faith is that mental act of man which places him in an acceptable relation to God. In Mohammedanism, faith in Allah is a prerequisite to knowledge of the divine and the bestowal of divine aid. In Hinduism, faith in Braham is the master key. In Buddhism, faith in the law which makes for good is an absolute necessity to the seeker after nirvana. Everywhere, faith is held to be the first, and absolutely necessary step toward attainment. If this be true concerning the exoteric teaching and doctrine, it is thrice true of the esoteric presentation of the truth for in the latter it takes on a mystic and occult significance. As an ancient mystic once said, there is a white magic in faith which transcends all other forms or powers of magic. In the exoteric teachings and doctrine, faith is advocated and demanded because of its claimed power to place man in close relationship with the Supreme Being, and to render possible a spiritual rapport or sympathetic accord with divine power. It is there held that the Supreme Being demands faith as a prerequisite of the bestowal of favors and gifts. In the esoteric teaching and doctrine, however, while faith is still more earnestly insisted upon as a prerequisite of attainment, there is not this rather naive and primitive explanation. Instead, faith is explained as that act by means of which the individual soul enters into a fuller recognition and realization of its essential identity with, and contact with the divine principle, and thus is enabled to unfold and to manifest those divine powers which are inherent and latent within its nature. Faith, in the exoteric sense, is a rapport, i. e., sympathetic accord relationship, in the esoteric, it is rather a rapprochement, 
or act of reapproach or coming together again after a separation, or act or fact of again coming or being drawn near or together. Even those not accepting the doctrine of the essential identity of the individual soul with the universal soul, and who occupy the agnostic position regarding this question, must be forced to admit as logically sound the argument that if the individual soul is potentially divine, then the act of earnest, positive faith in its potentially divine nature and possibilities must serve to unfold into manifestation such powers. The esoteric doctrine, however, does not rest merely upon this undoubtedly logically sound premise or proposition it bases its chief claim upon the fact that the soul which proceeds as if this were so soon begins to manifest its powers to such an extent that further doubt is impossible. Thus the proof for the esoteric teaching and doctrine is, at the last, a matter of actual personal experience. Cries the mystic, taste, only taste taste, and you will know the virtue of the wine. Faith in the infinite, then, consists primarily of the firm, earnest, positive belief in the three axiomatic statements heretofore presented to you, or their equivalents which are found in the esoteric teachings of any and all of the various great religions or philosophies of the world. If this faith be had and maintained, then it inevitably follows that faith in the beneficent good nature of the cosmic activities will arise. If the ultimate spiritual principle is embodied in the individual soul, then it must be inclined to be good to that soul. Ultimate reality must be good to itself, and if it recognizes the individual soul as a divine fragment of itself, then it must be good to that part of itself. The esoteric teaching and doctrine, however, hold that this recognition of common identity of the universal soul and the individual soul is more or less a mutual process they hold that the individual soul striving to enter into this consciousness of identity with the divine seeking its greater self sets into operation certain powers of the universal soul which cause the latter to seek rapprochement, or reapproach or coming together, of the two apparently separated portions of the divine essence, i. e the macrocosm and the microcosm. This being granted, it is easily seen that the act or mental attitude of faith in the infinite, and in one's essential relation to it, or essential identity with it, must operate in the direction of the rapprochement, or coming it together again, of the universal principle and its particular manifestation. Like the water spout appearing on the high seas, the water from the ocean swirls around and rises to meet and to be united with the descending whirling mass of heavy vapor from the clouds. Royce says, We long for the Absolute only in so far as in us the Absolute also longs, and seeks, through our very temporal striving, the peace that is nowhere in time, but only, and yet absolutely, in eternity. Evelyn Underwood says, All mystical thinkers agree in thinking that there is a mutual attraction between the spark of the soul the free divine germ in man, and the fount from which it came forth. The homeward journey of man's spirit, then, is due to the push of a divine life within answering to the pull of a divine life without. It is a going of like to like, the fulfillment of a cosmic necessity. Rhys Jack says, according to mysticism, the soul is led to the frontiers of the absolute and is even given an impulsion to enter but this is not enough. This movement of pure freedom cannot succeed unless there is an equivalent movement within the absolute itself. Francis Thompson, in his mystic poem entitled The Hound of Heaven, describes with a tremendous power, and often with an almost terrible intensity, the hunt of reality for the unwilling individual self. He pictures reality as engaged in a remorseless, tireless quest a seeking, following, tracking a down of the unwilling individual soul. He pictures the separated spirit as a strange, piteous, futile thing that flees from the pursuing reality down the nights and down the days. The individual spirit, not knowing its relation to and identity with the pursuing absolute, rushes in a panic of terror away from its own good. But, as Emerson says, you cannot escape your own good and, so the fleeing soul is captured at last, by faith in the infinite. However, the individual soul overcomes its terror of the infinite, and, recognizing it as its supreme good, it turns and moves toward it. Such is the mystic conception of the effect and action of faith in the infinite. Even those philosophers who view the cosmos as an infinite process, operated by an infinite spiritual law rather than by the will of a divine being even they, unreservedly and fully, likewise teach and preach the paramount value of faith in the infinite. Heraclitus 
the ancient Greek philosopher who taught the doctrine of the eternal becoming the Stoics with their doctrine of cosmic law and order and the ancient Buddhists with their doctrine of the law of eternal change all these taught as the highest wisdom the unquestioning faith in the law. Everything, they said, is under law, and proceeds according to order. Wisdom consists in having absolute faith in that law, and in falling in with its action movement and processes. Faith in and obedience to the law is the highest religion, said these thinkers and they held that only through such could the individual reach the mount of attainment. There are many practical philosophers of our own lands and age who, while more or less agnostic concerning the existence of a divine supreme being, at least of such conceived as a person, nevertheless are in full agreement with the ancient philosophers just mentioned in the general conception that the cosmos is governed by infinite law and proceeds according to eternal order and this law and order they conceive to be spiritual rather than material. Like Heraclitus, the Stoics, and the original Buddhists, the modern philosophers conceive it to be the highest wisdom on the part of man, as well as his manifest duty toward himself and the universe as well, to arouse and to manifest a firm absolute, certain and unquestioning faith in the existence and operation of the infinite law in the eternal order, and in the belief that it operates in the direction of ultimate good and to endeavor to move along with the cosmic current, to acquire and to maintain the cosmic rhythm, to beat time and to keep step with the cosmic order in short, to get and to keep in tune with the infinite. These thinkers, while very practical and pragmatic, nevertheless manifest toward this infinite law and eternal order a mental attitude of faith and confident expectation which closely resembles the corresponding mental attitude of the devout religious believer. To them, as to him, faith is the cardinal principle of their thought and action. They do not shrink from that extreme test of pragmatism, viz., would you trust your life to it? Instead, they trust not only their lives, but their welfare, their happiness and all that is worthwhile in human existence, to the operation of that law. They have found it to be the most practical form of philosophy a philosophy that works at an actual life, and which surely pays in the end. This pragmatic philosophy, like most of the philosophies worthy of the name, and like all of the great religions, is based upon faith and confident expectation. Like all other forms of earnest thought and belief, it has its roots in intuition and intuition breathes the very spirit of faith. It is not our purpose, nor our duty, to direct you concerning your form of religious belief, or regarding your school of philosophy. These are matters entirely for the exercise of your own reason with the cooperation of your intuition. But we conceive it to be our duty, and it is certainly our purpose, here to advise you, with all the earnestness at our command, to cultivate the mental attitude of faith absolute and unquestioning faith, in the presence and power of an infinite and eternal ultimate reality of a spiritual nature and to cultivate an equally earnest and fervent faith in the operation of the law and order manifested by that ultimate reality, call the latter what you will God, principle, power, truth, law, or the unknowable reality. Following this, and dependent upon it, should be the confident expectation that this infinite law and eternal order will tend to operate in the direction of your ultimate good, in the measure in which you have faith in it and confident expectation concerning its ultimate beneficent results, even if you cannot perceive the merit of the philosophical reasoning which leads to this conclusion, even if you are devoid of the religious conviction which brings the similar report, you are justified in accepting such a conception as warranted by the rule of pragmatism which is expressed in the axiom, that which works may be accepted as practical truth. Lack of faith in the infinite law and eternal order weakens you, and renders you less efficient therefore such is a negative quality. Actual distrust, disbelief, unfaith and doubt are worse than mere negative qualities they are positive and active in the wrong direction, and tend to reverse the movement action and direction of the cosmic forces, producing that shadow of good which is called evil, before beginning, and without an end, as space eternal and as surety sure, is fixed a power divine which moves to good, only its laws endure, it maketh and unmaketh, mending all what it hath wrought is better than hath been slow grows the splendid pattern that it plans its wistful hands between, it will not be condemned by anyone who thwarts it looses and who serves it gains, the hidden good it pays with peace and bliss, the hidden ill with pains, such is the law which moves to righteousness, which none at last can turn aside or stay the heart of it is love, 
and end of it is peace and consummation sweet. Obey, ho. Ye who suffer rhino ye suffer from yourselves not else compels, within yourself deliverance must be sought each man his prison makes. Laugh and be glad for there is liberty. Prentice Mulford, that eccentric genius who was really one of the great pioneers of the practical phase of the modern new metaphysical movement, although he is seldom given the credit to which he is really entitled in this particular field once expressed very forcibly the spirit of the true teaching concerning faith in the infinite, in the following remarkable passage culled from one of his early books, A Supreme Power and Wisdom Govern the Universe. The Supreme Mind is measureless and pervades endless space. The Supreme Wisdom, Power and Intelligence are in everything that exists, from the atom to the planet. The Supreme Power has us in its charge as it has the suns and endless systems of worlds in space. As we grow more to recognize this sublime and exhaustless wisdom, we shall learn more and more to demand that wisdom, draw it to ourselves, and thereby be ever making ourselves newer and newer. This means ever perfecting health, greater and greater power to enjoy all that exists, gradual transition into a higher state of being, and the development of powers which we do not now realize as belonging to us. Let us then daily demand faith, for faith is power to believe and power to see that all things are parts of the infinite spirit of God, that all things have good or God in them, and that all things, when recognized by us as parts of God, must work for our good. The following statement of the general basic principles of the modern New Thought movement was made several years ago by one of the writers of the present book. It is reproduced here because we think that it presents in concise form the essential spirit of the philosophy of that great modern school of thought just named, after the non-essential and debatable teachings of its various branches have been ironed out. I there exists a great underlying something or somewhat that is beneficent and well disposed toward you, and which trust to help, aid, and assist you whenever and wherever it can do so. Faith in the infinite too, faith and confident expectation regarding the beneficent power of that something or somewhat tends to open the channels of its influence in your life. While doubt, unbelief, distrust, and fear, tend to dam up the channel of its influence in your life, and to rob it of the power to help you. 3. To a great extent, at least, you determine your own life by the character of your thought by the nature and character of your thoughts you furnish the pattern or mold which determines or modifies the efforts of the something or somewhat to aid you, either in the direction of producing desirable results, or else in bringing about undesirable results by reason of your damming up the source of your good. These three fundamental principles of new thought which is really the oldest kind of thought expressed in new forms will serve you as the strongest kind of basic platform for practical new thought demonstration. If you will stand firmly on this platform make its teachings and principles a part of yourself and strive to manifest its truth and facts in your own life then you will be the very best kind of new thoughtist even though you may never have heard even a word of new thought teaching, metaphysical speculation, or philosophical theorizing. In that volume of this series entitled Spiritual Power, especially in its concluding section entitled Unison with Infinity, you will find a far more extended reference to this particular phase of the general subject of faith and confident expectation directed toward the infinite. If you are interested in this special teaching, we feel justified in recommending to your attention the book just named, The Advanced Students of the Esoteric Teaching Contained in the Scriptures of All the Great Religions, as well as their inspired teachers, are aware that in the Book of Psalms, in our own scriptures, are to be found several of the great masterpieces of the esoteric teachings concerning faith power in them is given the essence of the secret doctrine concerning faith in the infinite. Chief among these are the 23rd Psalm, and the 91st Psalm respectively. So important are these two great esoteric poems so filled with practical, helpful information are they that we deem it advisable to reproduce them here that you may avail yourself of their virtue and power at this particular stage of this instruction. Accordingly, they are given on the next following two pages of this book. The Psalm of Faith, Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, 
Thou anointest my head with oil my cup runneth over, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Psalm of Security, Psalm XCI He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that fleeth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee neither shall any plague come nigh thy faith in the infinite dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, and therefore will I deliver him I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble I will deliver him, and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him, and show him my salvation. The teachers and students of the inner teachings, the ancient wisdom, the secret doctrine, are also aware of the esoteric spiritual significance of the lines of the well-known hymn, Lead Kindly Light, written by Newman in a period of spiritual stress. Few who read or sing this hymn realize its esoteric spirit and meaning none but those who know perceive and recognize that which dwells under the surface of those wonderful words and lines but it is a matter of common notice and comment that even many persons who are outside of the fold of the church find great inspiration, help, courage and practical aid from that wonderful hymn. We feel that we may close this part of our instruction no more fitly than by quoting the lines of that magnificent verse. We trust that you may be able to plunge beneath its surface and discover in the deep places the spirit of that great chant of faith power. The chant of faith power, lead kindly light, lead kindly light, amid the encircling gloom lead thou me on. The night is dark, and I am far from home lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet I do not ask to see the distant scene one step enough for me, lead thou me on. Carry with you ever the spirit of the ancient aphorism of the wise sage which we have already quoted for your benefit in the pages of this book, and which adorns its title page, Faith is the White Magic of Power. 